Battleforce 2000 was released in very awkward stages, with the figures appearing separately on single cards in late 1987. The vehicles were released in early 1988, and two packs of the drivers were released during the normal 1988 G.I. Joe toy release time. Clearly, this broken up release schedule was indicative of a drastic last minute marketing change. Especially odd was the separation of driver and vehicle, since the combination format was a staple of G.I. Joe toys up to this point. There were two series. The first series consisted of six vehicles and drivers from 1987 and 1988, but the second series released in 1989 contained one vehicle and one figure who wasn't a driver, and that's all. Somewhere along the line, Hasbro dropped the ball when marketing these toys, and they weren't popular with kids. The recent warehouse find of leftover boxes of the figure 2 packs is a testament to the lack of confidence retailers had in this subseries at the time. For part two in my series of Balforce 2000 reviews, I'm going to be taking a look at the Sky Sweeper, the anti-aircraft tank and its driver, Knockdown, and the Marauder, the motorcycle tank and its driver, Dodger. Just going to remove the figure for convenience sake. The Marauder is actually a fairly long vehicle. Considering that most of it is supposed to be a motorcycle, this thing is almost as long as the Vector Jet in the series. Taking a look at its armaments first, it has two pivoting guns right in front of its front wheel here. They, uh, they don't pivot quite a lot, but they do pivot. On top of the front fairing, it also has another gun which doesn't pivot a lot. It doesn't swivel around a lot. There is actually a stopper which prevents it from going all the way around. On the back portion tank tread, trailer I guess you could say on the motorcycle. It has two very large missiles on either side. One very interesting thing about the missile and its placement is that the missile peg hole is actually rather close to the front of the missile rather than in the center. And the peg is likewise not really in the center of this trailer portion but close to the front, meaning that it's very biased towards being placed forward like this. Even though you might want to point your missiles the other way rather than into, <laughs> into your motorcycle uh, seated command vehicle there. As you can see, while personally I think it looks better this way, it also kind of hangs off the side there. So clearly it's really designed to be put on this way only. And its final armament is this very strange looking laser cannon. It's on a swiveling base here which is a little bit hard for me to get to, and my particular base is really, really tight. I almost want to grip the cannon itself, but because it elevates and depresses a little bit, it's on a hinge joint which I don't really want to stress. It's a very strange looking cannon with this, uh, this really large curved flash hider, which almost looks like a radar dish. And speaking of radar dishes, we'll take a look at the features of this vehicle next. And it has an arcing radar dish here. I guess you can keep it in whatever position you want. Mine is a little bit loose, however. You might want to keep it backwards just for the laser cannon. Or, I don't know, forwards for the missiles. The back portion also has a universal tow hook. So you can have your trailer towing another trailer, I suppose. And going back to the motorcycle, the whole front fairing actually turns. So you have the ability to steer the vehicle. Inside of the fairing, we actually have handholds pointing downwards just to simulate the figure actually holding and controlling the vehicle, as well as, I'm not really sure what you would call this on a real motorcycle, but part of the fairing actually has footwells. The rear occupant also has a single joystick, although what they're controlling from back there is anybody's guess. And now for the Marauders, second mode, you detach the trailer, and well that's it really. Now I fully realize what the designers were going for. Yes, I kept calling this thing a tank and trailer, but it was supposed to cover up those rear wheels and you were supposed to think that this was all just one vehicle, 
with the rear of the motorcycle being these tank treads. Kind of like the um, that German motorcycle where it, uh, it has the rear wheels being like tank treads so it can go through mud and snow. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. This thing. But the fact of the matter is, is that you're not really covering up the rear wheels all that much and well, you can still kind of see them in most angles. So this thing really just looks like a trailer to me. And with the back tank portion detached, now we have the look of a regular motorcycle. It does have tandem seating, which is really nice because it's regular seating rather than your traditional motorcycle narrow seating. And as you can see, instead of a two-wheeler, we actually have a three-wheeler here. It's a fairly narrow vehicle, as you would expect with a motorcycle, but it's actually kind of nice that it can just kind of stand by itself without the need of a, a kickstand or a sidecar to help it stand up straight. So the motorcycle has all the same features as it did when it was attached to this thing. And the same goes for this thing. This is really it. There's nothing that folds out. There's no interactivity with figures, which is very strange. You would think that there would be like a control panel, either sculpted or like a sticker, but there's nothing there. And this is the perfect spot for it which is generally where people actually pose a figure just to pretend that they're controlling something right here. But really, there's nothing in the blueprints or instruction sheet to suggest that. As a matter of fact, there's just because there's no place for a figure doesn't mean you can't place figures on it because as you can see, when you remove that missile, you can see that there are three foot pegs, one here and two very close to one another here. I'm not sure a figure can actually use that because they're so close together. But then again, with the missiles on, you can't use it anyway. They're right on top of those foot pegs. Underneath here, which I would have shown earlier, but honestly with the motorcycle attached to this very odd attachment point, I didn't really feel comfortable turning this thing over. And you can see it has these really uh, large fake wheels just to help the illusion of the treads here. I realize it sounds like I'm complaining a lot about what is essentially just a detachable trailer and nothing too gimmicky about that, but at least it's not as useless as the Dominator snow tanks shell which turns into a bunch of walls. With the missiles turned the other way and a figure in this gap here which, like I said before, looks like it ought to be a control panel, this thing looks perfectly fine as some type of a, a mobile missile and laser cannon emplacement. The Marauder driver, Dodger, comes with two accessories. First is his microphone. And he comes with what the contents list on the car calls an ultrasonic photon rifle. I love how they managed to put the scientific terms for both light and sound into this one weapon. One thing I really love, however, in the design is that spiked handguard, making this thing less Star Trek and more Mad Max. You also notice that both the handles actually have triggers on them. So I wonder if that both being ultrasonic, a sound portion and being a photon rifle are actually two separate ammunition choices that you have out of the one weapon. And speaking of different choices, there are two different versions of this rifle. Some have thick handles and some have thin. Now obviously I have the thin portion, but I don't have an example of a thick one. They're out there, they're fairly common, but I'm not going to go chasing after one because obviously one with a thick handle is going to strain the thumbs on an action figure. So it's not something that I want, really want to track down. But it is something that you do have to be aware of. And if you're a variation hunter, it's something to look out for. His rifle was also used for the 1993 mail-in Create a Cobra figure. I do apologize for misspeaking in my last review with Blaster, claiming that he was the only Balforce 2000 figure with army green on him, when that's obviously not true. And I ought to know that because Dodger here is actually my second favorite out of the seven Balforce 2000 figures. He's wearing a very dark, very subdued green here very perfect for military operations. And as such, with his gray camouflage, he really reminds me of a space marine. 
the type of design that you would see in Aliens, well, you know, the original movie. Because he reminds me so much of a space marine, I kind of overlook all the really weird design choices on him, especially this orange scaly shirt that he's wearing underneath here. It's a very subtle orange, it's not very bright. It might be coming out a little bit brighter on the camera than it actually is in real life. It has a sort of a brownish tint to it. But if you just see it as an orange scaly shirt, it does look like he's wearing Aquaman's shirt. The green, the contrast, that doesn't really help. One very interesting thing is the lack of paint detail on these three little armbands on him, which I'm actually grateful for. On the card artwork, they look like wristwatches. And I'm not really sure why he would have like three wristwatches and then another little dial on his hand there. I mean, sure, these could be like sensors or things like that, but honestly, it looks like he's trying to sell you a Rolex in an alleyway. Giving him open arms and fingerless gloves does give him kind of a macho kind of a look. I mean, he is a motorcycle driver after all. But then he also has little red dots on both his helmet and his shoulder here, suggesting that he does have some practical flashlights or infrared lights going on there. One specific thing I want to point out about Dodger's file card is his grade, grade E7, which means that he has a rank of Sergeant First Class, meaning that he is the highest ranking member of Battle Force 2000, most of them as staff sergeants or corporals. And that's very interesting because a lot of collectors actually consider him to be the leader of Battle Force 2000, even though there's nothing in his file card to suggest that he has any more command ability than any of the other members. And remember, it is a special forces team, so rank doesn't matter when it comes to command ability. If you're looking for a Marauder, a Dodger, or both on the aftermarket, the vehicle is actually one of the harder ones to find. It's not because it's rare, but it, because it's actually kind of fragile. As you can see here, this is the connection point which goes onto this lip here. And honestly, this thing is kind of easy to break off because honestly, it's just not wide enough to go on here. You really just have to push down quite significantly on here. And this thing is subject to break. Oddly enough, that's exactly the reason why the motorcycle brakes is because you can see the axles through the rear wheels. If you push down on that enough, those axles would simply break. They're just plastic tubes. So, I mean, honestly, any type of significant weight or weight over time will, of course, crack them. As for the figure, well, he comes with a microphone, which I wouldn't say is particularly hard to find, but it is one of the things that will sometimes not be with the figure. And of course, there's a variant to this rifle. But otherwise, he's a fairly easy figure to find on the aftermarket, complete with all of its parts. And now for the Sky Sweeper. Taking a look at its armaments first, it has two large cans on either side of the craft. The can barrels swivel all the way around, and are actually ratcheted, so not only can it hold a position, but you can get it into the same position as the one on the other side fairly easily. But just actually moving it out of the way, you can see that there are two missile heads poking out on either side of this engine cowling, but I'll get to those in just a minute. On the back, we have the anti-aircraft cannon. This cannon sits on a base which can swivel around 360 degrees, although mine is really very stiff. And on the base here, there is a little platform with one foot peg, so you can actually have a figure actually standing there controlling it. Obviously, there is some controlled detail on the surface here, but you could also pretend that this is controlled by the cockpit. The cannon itself can raise and lower, but as you can see, it's actually on a bar which also holds the radar dish. So they can both move at the same time or independently. And the uh, radar dish is just sort of pegged in there with a circular peg, so you can kind of swivel it around. If you don't like it cross-shaped, you can have it X-shaped instead. Moving on to the features of the overall tank, we have a lot of foot pegs. 
just six on the surface here, two here which are a little bit close together but they're still quite usable, two right between the universal tow hook, two on the other side which are far more far apart, a seventh one which is of course attached to the cannon as I mentioned before, and we have two on the front here right beside the driver for position, but this one has a lot of raised detail, making it very hard for you to put a figure's foot on there. I'd be very careful about putting any figure's foot there. But on the other side, we have one which is free and clear. Underneath the fake tank treads, we have dumbbell wheels. Not a lot of detail underneath there though. The really nice light bar detail is attached directly to the canopy, which opens forward like this, so you can access the driver's seat. It's a rather large driver's seat, and there isn't really a lot of control detail, which is very odd. And now for the Skysweeper's secret second mode. You have to unclip and remove the engine cowling, just by pulling it directly up as well as removing the antenna from the top here, which slides back and out. And now what you're going to do with the engine cowling is to pull down and out the side cannons. And I realize this looks like a lot of parts forming, and you're right, but it's going to be worth it in the end. You're going to treat this portion here with the large opening as the top, and the one with the little small opening as the bottom here. As a matter of fact, if you look on the inside, it actually is marked top. So you notice that it now has two indents on the side here. And you're going to take your cannon, and you're going to make sure that the, uh, the cannon base, upon which the cannon actually rotates, is flat on the top. So you're going to push that. There are two sliding pegs there. And they slide in and lock into place. And yes, I realize that the sticker is now upside down, but there's nothing you can really do about that. You can actually place them upside down if you want. Like, if you want this, this side one on here, you can put that one on there if you want to. But it actually sits a bit lower on this entire body here. So personally, I like it with the upside down stickers just so it is a bit more proportional. And you do so on the same side. And what was the uh, sliding hole for the cannons is now where you put the antenna. You can slide that all the way in. And what you're left with is a little sentry post. At least that's what they're calling it. Honestly, it looks like a little robot from the 1950s. But on the inside, we have a foot peg there for a figure. And here it is with a figure inside, positioned in just such a way that his face actually does poke out of the peephole. Back to the Skysweeper main vehicle, with the engine cowling removed, you can now see the engine detail. Although, I have to say, it's not as detailed that you would think that it just has an exposed engine without the cover on it. Honestly, it looks just fine, just as it is here. But as you can see, you've now exposed the missiles properly. And they're just stuck in there with these big sliders, which honestly, they don't really hold missiles in very well. So, uh, several G.I. Joe vehicles actually have this type of mechanism rather than your traditional post and peg. Uh, I think the 1987 Persuader vehicle also had that. And like I said, they don't hold in very particularly well. However, you do get four forward-facing missiles, which, like I said, were accessible even when the engine cowling was on here. It's just that they weren't visible. And putting the engine cowling back over the engine, you have to make sure that you are putting the antenna back on first because this thing actually covers up the space needed to slide that thing back in. And to make sure that the bottom portions of the base for the cannons are flat because that's actually what locks onto the sides right here. And also the back portion of the engine cowling has that little notch there which corresponds to the notch here which holds it and locks it all in place. 
I have to admit that I like the Skysweeper way more than I like the Marauder, even though it has an equally obvious second mode. At least the second mode is kind of fun looking. Like I said, you can either treat it as a sentry pulse as it's meant to be, or just use it as some type of a weird 1950s retro futuristic robot. And the tank is, well, still a tank. But the tank's just overall aesthetics is so kind of retro futuristic, kind of the thing that you would actually see Kenner doing for the Star Wars line back in the late 70s, early 80s, especially with the use of the blue plastic in this huge uh, radar dish. It just looks like something out of their version of the old Death Star. The Sky Sweeper's driver, Knockdown, comes with two accessories. First is his removable helmet. The helmet has tech and tubing all over it, all picked out in paint, which is quite unique to the helmet, even though I don't particularly like the cobbled together look that this thing has. It's like something the Borg would wear. One very interesting thing about the plastic quality of the actual helmet is that the green is subject to rubber rod. As you can see, this thing has a whole bunch of brown spots all over it. And no, they're not supposed to be there. That's not paint. That is literally rubber rot. And I've seen UK versions, which actually has a brighter green plastic used for this particular part, which I think seems to deter the rubber rot quite a bit better than what the North American releases used. As you can see on the original card artwork, there would have been a visor going across his helmet and not just the silver piece. I really wish they had kept that in because then it would have just added more symmetry to the helmet. I probably would have liked it a little bit better. And finally, he comes with what's called on the contents list of the card, an X-128 Experimental Ground-to-Air Pistol. One very interesting thing to note about the Experimental Pistol, other than the fact that it doesn't tell you what it's shooting ground-to-air, could be a grenade or a missile or something like that, it doesn't specify, is the fact that it has this gigantic caulking handle, or at least what I'm thinking is a caulking handle anyway. It seemed to have detail of like a little slider along here. One very other interesting thing about this thing is that, like Dodger's rifle, there was actually a variant where the handles were actually thicker or thinner. This is the thin version, and I actually do have a thick version of the handle handy here. And you can see that they are well different and very easy to recognize when you're looking at it from front or back, but if you're looking at it from the side, it's very hard to tell. Rather funny how much I like Dodger but didn't like his vehicle, the Marauder, whereas here we have the opposite position. I really like the Skysweeper, but I really don't like the figure all that much. The head is well, it was actually reused a number of times, I think once for Super Trooper and another time for Rapid Fire. It's very odd because it's a very chiseled, very squarish, blocky kind of a look that his head has. And in fact, I don't think it fits his helmet very well. Either that or the helmet, just because of the rubber rot, has actually shrunk and doesn't fit on his head very well. I mean, you have to really squeeze it down. And while his design is actually a bit more symmetrical than many of the other uh, characters, I mean, I can't really complain about his colors. But the fact of the matter is, is that they chose to sculpt him with like the widest chest possible. It's really quite strange. Even his thighs are really quite wide. I'm not sure if that was supposed to suggest that he's really muscular, uh, sort of an 84 roadblock kind of thing going on, because honestly, with the skinny arms, which are part of the um, original sculpting buck, I mean, I don't think they could, they could really change that back in the 80s and 90s. But honestly, it just really emphasizes just how wide and bloated he looks. It's just not a very good look overall. And one very interesting thing is... Um, Sometime during the production, as you can see, like his chest, if you just ignore his arms for a minute, his chest is like 80% beige and 20% blue. So what do you think that they actually molded his chest out of? 
Well, the blue, of course. So that all this beige real estate, if you scrape it, there's always like blue underneath it. Later versions have actually molded this thing in beige. And I think that those were mostly distributed to the UK and Europe, unfortunately. So most of the ones that you will find here in North America, you'll almost always find them with some scratch or something like that. And it's always this uh, light blue, bright light blue shining right through it. It's really annoying to be perfectly honest and would have been totally avoidable if they had just molded this thing in beige. If you're looking for a sky sweeper or a knockdown or both on the aftermarket, there are a couple of things that you do have to look out for. Despite the fact that like all Bellforce 2000 figures and vehicles, they're really easy to find on the aftermarket and they're usually complete. However, you do have to make sure that you do have all four of the missiles for the sky sweeper because they are hidden underneath the engine cowling. And if you're putting one together to make sure that you have left and right versions of the cans because there is a left and right version of them. They are actually marked on the other side with L and R. So that's one good thing. And of course there is the removable antenna, which is <laughs> meant to be removed. So of course that thing is going to get lost every so often. As for the figure, there's not much to say other than the fact that you do have to look out for the paint wear on this guy's chest. Stay tuned for next week where I'll take a look at the Balfour 2000 Vector Jet and its pilot Maverick, as well as the Illuminator 4-wheel drive Jeep and its driver Blocker. <laughs>